In EcoEvo, we've covered a lot of different interesting design of houses from very different materials, different design, different construction method. Today, we are going to look at something you may feel a bit more familiar with. It's a conventionally looking weatherboard house, but it has a lot of special features to make it very, very special. So today we're with Ken, and he's the guy responsible for this retrofit, which is an amazing retrofit. Ken, can you take us through some of the features from the front of the house here? Yeah, sure can, John. So this is a, about a 1910 era weatherboard. Yeah. So when we bought it, it was yeah. a little bleaky sieve. Yeah. Had uh, pretty much no insulation, mm. single glazing. You could see skylight, sky coming out from around the doors. Yeah. So pretty typical for a weatherboard yeah uh, but it needed a, a thorough renovation mm. and uh, so that's what we we embarked on mm -hmm. and trying to get it really super energy efficient mm -hmm. and extra comfortable awesome and that's what we've tried to do but we've ha had to do it within the constraints of our heritage overlay mm. so there's only so much you can do to the facade of the building yep. and we're facing out to the north here on the street oh, frontage shit. as well yeah so we're really limited in mm -hmm. terms of passive solar mm. so you understand the trials and tribulations that we have to go through to get a retrofit to a passive house sort of principled home. We'll cover some of those issues that we had as we walk through. With this glazing that you've ended up putting in, how did you go with that and what, did, what sort of glazing did you put in? Yeah, so that's all triple glazing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, argon filled, so it's pretty high performance stuff with yep. timber frames. Uh, and here at the front, mm -hmm. we had to retain the same shape and size mm. of those windows and mm -hmm. in fact this large window that you can see here in mm -hmm. front of you was a, a sat double sash window before mm -hmm. and so the new mullions that we can see on this window mm -hmm. are positioned exactly as they were on the original window wow. so we're trying to make it look like for like from the street as much as we can and sort of yeah. uh, reflect the heritage of the building yeah. while it's still at the same time bringing it into the 21st century in terms of its energy and, and comfort levels. I can see that because you've even got a car charger on the side of the house here haven't yeah, you? Yeah, so so that's part of the thing, I suppose, is high yeah. performance buildings, high yeah. performance cars. Absolutely. So that's a, an a electric hybrid car. Yeah. And that's part of the other thing that we did here. So mm. when we first bought the, the building, mm. uh, the first thing I did was call up Multinet, mm -hmm. who's a local gas distributor, yeah. and said, look, I want to get off gas. All electric. And so about where you're standing now is where the gas meter Jeez. was. So they pulled out the gas, uh, capped it on the street. Yeah. And so we've gone all electric for everything. Awesome. And that includes the car. Awesome. And you've got some beautiful Australian Australian fauna at the front here and I'll, we had the lorikeets out here before which is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah so it's terrific at this time of year with the gum trees um, flowering so we get the birds coming in, we get in the summer we get all the insects coming and drinking the water in the billabong here so okay. it's really sort of consistent with our philosophy here of trying yeah. to live lightly on the land and give back to the, the country as best we can. Beautiful. All right let's 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 walk through. Let's do. So Cam what have we got here? So the bit that we're staying in now is the mm. kitchen and the living area, so mm -hmm. this is all new. Right. So in a lot of ways this was actually easy. Yep. We just demolished the 1980s extension that was mm -hmm. here that was, you know, of its era. It had no insulation, leaked like I said, yep. and it was freezing cold, mm -hmm. uh, and we built new. So in a way, that's a clean slate and that's easy. Beautiful. The bit behind us that we just walked in is the old part of the house, mm. and that's the bit that's really tricky. Yeah. Because we were trying to retrofit into that mm -hmm. something that was really insulated and airtight. Mm. And when you're trying to do that around the existing construction, mm. that gets really, really tough. Uh, mm. But this part that we're in now is all new. Okay. Um, and the other aspect of this really is again, because the street is facing north, there mm. was a question of how we get light into this part of the house and also how we get that, the energy, the solar heat gain that comes yeah. with that. And so in order to try to achieve that, our building designer built this sort of uh, almost a pavilion type arrangement mm -hmm. where we come through the kitchen here, we have a bit of a cutout uh, across the way here mm -hmm. where we've got the sun streaming in yeah. to the living room at the back. Beautiful angles in there going on to your rammed earth. 
Yeah, so that was part of the sort of the architectural flourish uh -huh. was to get this this sh this shape on the roof form, uh -huh. and so that was very much again about providing some projected. Uh, projecting the roof form up to the north to try and capture that low winter sun to mm -hmm. get it deep into the building, mm -hmm. but also to ensure that we get as much sunlight into the backyard as we could. Because mm -hmm. the backyard was always going to be our productive garden. Yep. So the space of the house in which we, uh, we have, have the veggies and so on. And yeah. in order for that to work, obviously, we've got to make sure we've got some, get us some sunlight in there. Yeah. So we can't have the building constantly shading that space. But what we find in this house really is it's not the summer overheating problem. Mm. Because of the building orientation and the way in which the, the building has been in, enveloped yep. uh, thermally, is it doesn't really get particularly hot. Mm. The, the challenge really for us, I think, is the winter, yep. um, which is in Melbourne, of course, a much longer, longer time than the summer mm. overheating situations. Yep. Yep. It is quite a surprise to me you mentioned summertime is not an issue because and where, as I look at it, you've got a fairly large um, north-facing high bay window area. Yeah, I would have thought you, every now and then you would have quite substantial overheating issue. But I think it has something to do with the extended projection of the roof to protect the direct sun from the high bay window. And also you have plenty of um, render to provide thermal mass to soak up the extra heat. Yeah, that's right. So our building designer was terrific at dealing with the shadowing and looking at the positioning of windows and the positioning of the eaves and the depth of the eaves to make sure that we weren't getting that summer sun striking straight at our windows and, and overheating the building. Mm -hmm. So in the winter, the sun will will be, uh, come down below the eaves and, and stretch deep into the, into the home and to, to warm us up and provide that that, that light and in the summer months the sun is well and truly above the eaves and there's no way that sun will strike any of these these north facing windows. So there's a little trick in the design there mm -hmm. to make sure you avoid that overheating. It's just simply a, geom a geometry problem and so these days all the building designers and architects have got their computer software. It's quite easy for them to be able to run these sort of shading analyses to actually see uh, what sort of geometry is going to work mm. for the building. So we've only lived in the home since it's been okay, like right. this. But you've got a lot of data on it, right? We've got heaps of data on yeah, it. So this is cool. perhaps one of my things, mm. is to actually monitor what the building is doing mm -hmm. uh, out of curiosity in mm -hmm. a way, but also as a, a verification check. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, our house was the most expensive thing I'll ever uh, yep. invest in. And so I want to know that it's actually performing. Mm. in accordance with, with what it's been designed to do. And that's what really appealed to me about Passive House, mm. was that I was actually paying for something which was verified. Mm. Uh, and so I've got about 10, 15 different temperature, humidity sensors across the building. Mm -hmm. The rammed earth that you can see behind me here, I've got temperature sensors embedded in that. Uh, I'll monitor all of our electricity consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the things we've sort of discovered in the three years we've been mm. here is that we're uh, including the car, mm -hmm. which is an electric car, mm -hmm. that we're producing about 30 to 40 percent more power mm -hmm. from the solar electricity than we consume. And that includes all of the appliances like the TV and so on, yeah. the cooking, we've got an induction cooktop, an electric oven, uh, the domestic hot water, so yeah. we use a heat pump for the hot water, right. um, for our heating needs, uh, for the reverse cycle air conditioner yeah. and a small heat pump uh, hydronic setup. Uh, and, and of course the car as well. And you've got a family here too, right? And we're a family and we do all the normal things That's that everybody cool. else does. It's not like we live in a cave. So Cam, what was the idea with the rammed earth? Yeah, so this was something we really loved as a material. Mm. So first and foremost, we just thought that it looked really beautiful <laughs> and it's got a real sense of character in life yeah. that uh, plaster just doesn't mm. have. And across the day, you just get it changes subtly changes colour, and you get shading mm. and uh, shadowings and stuff forming on it. It's got a real uh, life to yeah. it. Um, the other aspect to it was in, uh, to provide some thermal mass, and that's something we, which we were very much on the fence about as we sort of moved towards this passive house idea. And it's something probably in retrospect we paid a little bit more attention to than we needed to. Okay. Having gone down the passive house route and built a building fabric that was really airtight and really thermally efficient, uh, you just really don't need that thermal mass to balance out those two hot and those two cold periods. That's cool. 
And in a way, it, it, it introduces a lot of complexity mm. because it's much harder to make the building airtight when you have materials like concrete and rammed earth. Uh, and it's much more difficult to ensure that you've got a thermal bridge free design. So you've got insulation consistently running you know around all the building. about that. So how did you deal with that insulation consistency issue? So what we did here is the, uh, the rammed earth is insulated externally with a phenolic foam, which is a quite high performance foam. So it's clad externally and then it's sitting on a, a, a concrete footing. Mm -hmm. But between the concrete footing and the rammed earth, we've got an XPS, an extruded polystyrene foam. So a high compression foam. Wow. So in that way, we're essentially creating a thermal battery that's entirely uh, wrapped in insulated in, in the building. So the only exposed surface is to the inside, which is you know, how thermal mass should work yeah. uh, if it's going to work well. Yep. Uh, the other aspect of the thermal mass is, is the concrete slab. So we've got a small slab, it's only about five by five metres. Uh, there's a structural slab underneath what you can see here. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a, a, again a phenolic insulation foam sitting on top of that structural slab. Then another 100 millimetres of, of concrete screed, which is what you can see here. That's the exposed concrete. And sitting within that is a small hydronics, uh, hydronic coil, Ooh. heating coil. Oh, it's hydronic there. We used that for the first winter, but we haven't used it since. Uh, instead, we find that we just use the reverse cycle air conditioner mm. because we just need, in a building like this where the temperature just doesn't vary that mm. much, you don't need a heating system that's just constantly on. You just need to top up the heat occasionally and the reverse cycle is a really efficient way it's to like do that. It's like bringing a bazooka to a knife fight, right? <laughs> <laughs> in a way. And it, yeah. it's just, it just adds so much complexity to a building to try and incorporate thermal mass. Yeah. And for the passive house approach, it's probably just not necessary in the vast majority of cases. Um, would we do it again, the rammed earth? Absolutely, yeah. just because we love it as a material. Yep. And, and again, you can make it work. And what yeah. we've found with our monitoring mm -hmm. is that even when it gets relatively cold inside, mm. and it doesn't get cold in a sense versus most mm. Australian homes, mm. the rammed earth is, is always about a degree warmer yeah. than the inside temperature. Oh, wow. So it's contributing that heat marginally back, back into the space. Cool. And then vice versa, in the middle of summer, when yeah. it's getting really hot in here, yeah. maybe 25, 26 it's degrees, colder. the rammed earth is always a degree or so colder. Awesome. So it's sucking up that heat. So it's helping us a little bit mm. at the peaks. But I wouldn't overplay that mm. and suggest that that's fundamental to the performance of the building. Okay. There's the other aspects of the passive house approach that are contributing that. So this is actually the same material that we've got at our driveway. So yep. it comes out of a quarry in Dramana, which is just south of Melbourne here. Uh, and they brought in 32 cubic metres of gravel, basically. That's mm. what it is. And then they mix it on site with about a 10% uh, cement binder. Yep. They don't add any water to it, so it's not a slurry like concrete right. would be. And then they put up these metal shutters and they basically get a bobcat and they drop the the gravel mix yep. into that space and then they have a ram, a pneumatic ram, and they whack it down. Mm. Ram it down. And what you're left with when they take these metal shutters off are these sort of what look like rectangular blocks almost. Yep. Uh, and this, this finish here. So this is just the pure raw rammed earth finish once you take those metal shutters off. And do you need to put any sealer on it? So it, it's got a, a very um, liquidy sort of a viscous sealer on it, mm -hmm. um, but, it but it's not finished. It, it, you can pick, easily pick away the dirt from within it. Mm. Uh, it it's just a small uh, minor sealer on top. Okay, Cam, so passive house principled home, supreme air tightness. What are you doing to ventilate the place? Yeah, so we've got <laughs> mechanical ventilation, which is yeah. this guy right here. So mm -hmm. we call her Bertha because mm. all of my friends that come around, they talk about that heater that you've got in the laundry. Mm. And so as I keep trying to explain to them all the time, mm. it's not a heater, no. it's a heat exchanger. Yep. And so it runs at just under 30 watts, which mm -hmm. is nothing. Mm. It's basically two fans down in the bottom here. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we bring in fresh air from outside mm. that at this time of year when it's winter, it's pretty cold. Mm -hmm. We bring, bring back stale, humid, warm air mm -hmm. from the wet spaces. So from the bathrooms and the laundry and the kitchen. We run it across the heat exchanger, mm -hmm. we extract the heat from that outgoing air, we put that heat into the incoming air, which then goes into the living spaces. 
and that's constantly on all the time and it just churns away just really slowly so you don't hear it you don't feel it there's no sense of breeze or anything in the house but it's just constantly giving you that distribution of fresh air into the building and I'm not relying on there being wind outside or or a difference in temperature which creates the convective air movement inside and to outside or indeed even on opening the windows. Mm. And so the way I describe it is kind of like a window that's perfect mm. because it's delivering air at the right temperature, that's filtered, yeah. doesn't have the mozzies, the flies and so on. Yeah. So your bathrooms, toilets? Yeah, so that's, that's the other big difference to most Australian building practice is you can't have a standard extract fan mm. that we have in uh, Australian homes. Yeah. As soon as you put one of those in a passive house, mm. your air tightness is completely gone. So the advantage of mechanical ventilation like this mm. is you're extracting that humidity out of the bathrooms. So if we take a wander up there, I'll show you how that sure. works. Right, right, so here in the bathroom, We've got two ex extract vents up yeah. in the ceiling yeah. and those two are connected to the mechanical ventilation system and then again it's constantly on so we've constantly got the humid air that's in the bathroom being dragged up into there and out of the building mm -hmm. but retaining the heat. Yep. Uh, and when we have a shower mm -hmm. Most of the time, you don't really need the, the fan on anything other than its standard setting. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've got as a simple little mm -hmm. switch, mm -hmm. so that if, when we come in here, it's mm -hmm. basically a boost switch, mm -hmm. and you can just press the button, and the whole system will go up to high boost, mm -hmm. pretty much in the same way that a conventional extractor mm -hmm. fan works. Mm -hmm. But rather than just throwing all that heat energy within that air outside, mm -hmm. you extract the heat while throwing out the, the humidity. The other great thing about this is because it's running all the time, as soon as you, with a conventional extractor fan, you turn it off after 10 minutes, you leave the room, but the tiles and everything is still wet. Mm -hmm. So this space gradually builds up humidity for hours after mm -hmm. you've had a shower, and that humidity can just drift back into the rest of the house. Whereas with mechanical ventilation, you constantly have the movement of air, pressure, yeah. negative pressure, which is dragging all that humidity out of the building rather than drifting back into the rest of the house. Cam, you and the team did a great job changing these properties from a heritage-listed renovator's delight to award-winning architecture. Can you tell us what the awards is all about and also what is the greatest lesson you learned from changing an old crappy house into an energy-efficient exemplary building? Yeah, so we were pretty happy actually. So we got three awards for the place. Um, National Association of Building Designers, Sustainable Home of the Year in 2018. Uh, we also got a couple of other awards, uh, National Residential Sustainable Building of the Year with Sustainability and Architecture magazine, and Best of the Best as well, which is mm. kind, of, kind of nice. Mm. But best of all, we get to live in the place. Mm. Exactly. And, and the big difference really is that it's comfortable all the time, costs us next to nothing to run, so our electricity bills are about $400 a year, and that's covering all of the heating and cooling and the appliances and running the car for about 10,000 kilometres. So really we've eliminated, largely eliminated, our, our ongoing costs. Um, but probably the, the greatest lesson I think here is that we've got this huge uh, amount of existing building stock that we can convert, that there's never any excuse not to be able to do this. It requires a deal of thought and effort, but it can be achieved. Now, after three years, we've just run an air tightness test and it's pretty much where we left it, right? Yeah, so that's, that's terrific. So I'm really thrilled about that. Mm. So when we uh, completed the building in order to try and get certification yeah. for Enerfit, which mm. is the passive house renovation standard, yeah. we needed to achieve one air change per hour at 50 Pascal, mm. and we got 1.2. Yep. And that was after four rounds of really hard effort tough. to try and find those last few holes. Yeah. And now we've just done another test and we're mm. 1.18. Mm. So pretty mm. much the same as we were three years ago. So that's really reassuring to mm. know that all the effort we went to with the membrane mm. and the taping and the gluing it's holding up. is holding up. Mm. Oh, yeah, which means you still got the new car feeling, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's great to know that having gone to all that effort and indeed that money, mm. that it's actually holding up over time. Joseph found a few holes, so maybe you've got some room for improvement too. There's always room for improvement. <laughs> always. Awesome. All right, mate. Beautiful. That's it. Thanks, Thank you. Sean. Good to see you, Joseph. Good to see Thank you. Thank you, Kim. No worries.